John Chauvin suggested that we might discuss comprehensive tax reform uh, this morning, I said, you know, John, uh, we might have, you know, you're setting the program in late 2012, we might have a grand fiscal bargain. Uh, all the tax issues are going to be off the table. Uh, no one will want to talk about taxes at this point. Uh, but as you can see, I'm not very good at forecasting uh, where we stand. Uh, today seems to be uh, a moment when there's tremendous interest in thinking about tax policy. If we just look at this week, uh, Representative Ryan of Wisconsin, the House Budget Chair, has laid out a comprehensive budget proposal. Uh, which includes as a key piece uh, changing the tax structure to lower rates and broaden the base in a basically revenue neutral way. Uh, although the details are not yet clear, uh, Senator Murray of Washington, the Senate Budget Chair, has laid out a competing proposal uh, which would uh, allegedly uh, do tax reform but primarily focusing on base broadening at the higher end of the distribution. Uh, Representative David Camp, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, is working simultaneously on a significant tax overhaul proposal, uh, which will develop uh, as, as the year goes forward. And of course, there's a, there's a basic recognition uh, that if we do, in fact, get some grand fiscal bargain that emerges sometime later this year or next year, that it's very likely to include both revenue changes as well as, as, as action on various entitlement programs. So that, in some sense, sets the stage for our discussion this morning which is the recognition that uh, perhaps more so than any, any point in the last few years, the likelihood of some kind of significant and comprehensive tax action in the next 12 to 18 months is greater than at many points in the recent past. Uh, and exactly what that will be is very hard to forecast, but of course that's what we're here to talk about and to try to get some understanding of. Uh, the panel this morning is in some sense the dream team to come and talk about comprehensive tax reform and to help educate us on these issues. Uh, the two speakers will be Len Berman and Glenn Hubbard. Uh, Len is the Daniel Moynihan Professor of Public Policy at Syracuse University, uh, and he is one of the deans of American public finance economists, having contributed both to the research activity in this field as well as to the understanding of practical tax policy. He was Deputy Assistant Secretary of Tax Policy at Treasury during the late 1990s. I would add a footnote. The last time we had a balanced budget and revenues actually exceeded, uh, exceeded spending. And then after that, he played an absolutely critical role as one of the co-founders and, and, and co-directors of the Tax Policy Center at the Urban Institute and Brookings Institution in Washington, which is the go-to place for information on tax policy uh, for anyone who's looking to learn about the way U.S. tax policy operates. Uh, Len is also the author with, uh, with Joel Slemrod of a recent book, uh, which is uh, What Every American Needs to Know, Taxation in America, What Every American Needs to Know. And he'll distill some of that into his comments this morning. Uh, our second speaker is Glenn Hubbard. Glenn is one of the longest serving deans of American business schools, the dean of the Columbia Business School in New York. Uh, he's also a professor of economics and finance at Columbia. Uh, Glenn, I'm sure, is no stranger to you. Uh, he has served in a variety of um, major policy roles associated with tax policy in the US government. He was Deputy Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy at Treasury in the early 1990s when he played a key role in drafting a major reform proposal for the corporate income tax in the US. Uh, he served as Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors in 2001 to 2003, a time when, you will remember, we had dramatic tax reform in the United States, and Glenn was one of the, the key forces bringing the economic analysis and insight of those policies to bear as they were designed and ultimately implemented. And of course, he served, as many of you will have seen, as one of the primary economic advisors to Governor Romney uh, during the recent presidential campaign. So I am going to turn the, the microphone over to Len, who will be our, our first speaker, followed by Glenn. I'll then jump back in and say a little bit, and then we'll open for commentary and discussions. So Len, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's actually worth the trip just to hear Jim say such nice things about me. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's one of the, I mean, he is the rock star of public finance. Uh, the tax reform is really the reason I'm a public finance economist. My dissertation was actually about housing, just a little bit about taxes. But in 1985, I went to the Treasury Department to work on what became the Tax Reform Act of 1986. And when you look back on it, you think, well, you know, I mean, that, clearly that was going to happen. Nobody thought tax reform was actually going to happen. When Ronald Reagan said in 1984, I'm instructing my Treasury Department to put together a plan to reform the tax system, which will be released after the election, I said, yeah, sure, 
Uh, Treasury, nobody at Treasury Department actually figured out that it was just supposed to be a political ploy, and they wrote this wonderful document called Tax Reform for Fairness, Simplicity, and Economic Growth. And then the actual heroes of tax reform, you know, you think of the current tax system as, or the current political system is completely dysfunctional, and we think back to the, you know, the, the halcyon days when Congress was run by these great uh, legislative heroes, and the, the people who made tax reform happen were Dan Rostinkowski, who eventually went to jail for stealing postage stamps, and Bob Packwood, who had a weekly meeting where he had for $10,000, people would come and tell him their favorite ways to mess up the tax code. Uh, but somehow, and, and all the cynics, you know, in Washington, cynicism often substitutes for, or is a, substitutes for wisdom. All the cynics said, well, it's not going to happen. And I didn't think it was going to happen, but I sort of wanted to see it. And it did happen, and things were very similar in some ways. Everybody understood that our tax system really was broken. There were runaway tax shelters. People thought the tax system was unfair. They thought the rich weren't paying their fair share. Uh, they were concerned about the effects of the tax system on the economy. Uh, and, and of course, the conventional wisdom was, well, tax reform, you know, we have all these special entrenched interests. They'll keep tax reform from happening. But somehow they didn't. So now, Fast forward to 2013, and we have sort of a similar situation. Everybody agrees the tax system is broken. As Jim said, you know, we've got proposals for tax reform on both the, the Democratic side, Republican side. I should also point out that Jim Paterba served on President Bush's panel, which put together a fabulous tax reform proposal, actually two proposals, which were really worthy of consideration. And for some reason, the President actually forgot that he had asked for tax reform by the time he got the proposals. But there are a number of actually good proposals out there that could be that that, that we, we could take up. Uh, the tax system is in, is is inefficient. Everybody recognizes that it's unfair and it's widely perceived to be unfair. It's not raising enough revenue to actually pay for the government, and we also face some really spe uh, big challenges going forward. Uh, one is, you know. A lot of us are focused on the debt right now, and debt is at very high levels relative to post-war history. But the current situation is not really that bad. If you look at the Congressional Budget Office's most recent projections going forward, we've got tax revenues going back to about their, their, their average levels, or a little bit above their average levels over the last 30 years, uh, spending uh, a little bit above the average levels over the last, last 30 years. The, it looks like over the next 10 years the situation isn't that bad, but the big problem is that uh, going forward, we ha we're going to have unprecedented demands on the federal government. We've got the aging of the baby boomers and the fact that we haven't been able to figure out how to control health care costs. And those two things together are going to put unprecedented demands on the government. And Paul Ryan has a proposal to <clears throat> cut spending to levels of historical tax revenues. Uh, that that's technically plausible, but politically, I think it's actually impossible. And if you look at coming up with a tax system that could raise not 20, you know, not 19 percent or 18 percent of revenue, which is the historical average, but maybe 23, 24, 25 percent, which is what we would need, even if we're exceptionally successful at controlling health care costs, we'd need a reform tax system. We also have rising economic inequality. And even if you don't care about the fact that economic inequality is at the highest level it's been at since uh, the eve of the Great Depression, it is a political problem. And there will be proposals to do things to, to deal with economic inequality that could be much, less, much more damaging to the economy than, say, having a progressive tax system. It's also true that the income tax system now is an essential part of the social safety net. The, uh, the, the Census Bureau put out uh, an alternative poverty measure where they actually accounted for the effect of things like the Earned Income Tax Credit and the Child Tax Credit. The Earned Income Tax Credit is the single biggest factor in reducing poverty of all of government programs. Uh, it does, it does for, for working age people, it does more than temporary assistance for needy families, thing we think of as welfare, food stamps, all of those other programs. So tax reform has to take on the role of the tax system in in, in, in reducing economic inequality. Uh, there's also a concern about the growing share of Americans who pay no income tax. And this, this was a big deal during the last presidential campaign. I don't think Governor Romney put the issue 
uh, as, as well as he might have. But there is a concern that if close to half of Americans uh, are not paying income tax, that they might perceive that the cost of government is essentially zero. You might say, well, you know, if we're doing deficit financing, maybe everyone would think the cost of new government programs is zero. But that's certainly a problem in terms of, uh, in terms of our, our political system. So what should tax reform accomplish? One thing is it should raise enough revenue to pay for the government. Uh, second, I think it should maintain progressivity and critical social safety net features. Third, is it should simplify the tax system, simply, simple enough so people actually understand what they're doing when they file their taxes. Uh, fourth, it should tax the 47% or 46% that on the margin, people should see that they have some skin in the game, that they actually have a role in paying for the government, government services. Uh, it should help rein in entitlements. Uh, and you might think, well, how can tax reform do that? I'll get back to that in just a moment. Uh, and it should, it, should, uh, it should not put too much of a drag on the economy. Every tax system takes an economic toll, but uh, all of our problems going forward will be bigger if the economy is growing more slowly than if it's growing faster. And then the hardest thing on my list uh, is somehow we should make it last. You know, I started out talking about Tax Reform Act of 1986. This was the halcyon days when we produced a perfect tax system and it lasted about a nanosecond. So how do we do that? Well, the, what people are talking about is uh, cutting tax expenditures. And this is the technical term that public finance economists use to talk about spending programs that are run through the tax code. Uh, the Congressional Research Service put out a, a, a report just a few days ago where they listed 250 subsidy programs that are run through the tax code. And you know what goes on the list or or isn't on the list is, is subject to some debate. But it's certainly true that a lot of things that used to be done by traditional spending agencies are now run by the tax code. And a lot of long-standing features of the tax system actually have the effect of being big subsidies for things like buying homes, uh, getting health insurance at work, and things like that. What's the allure of cutting these tax expenditures? Well, first of all, there's the Willie Sutton theory of tax reform, which is that it's where the money is. If you add up all of these tax expenditures, they're on the order of a trillion dollars a year. That's roughly the amount of money we bring in from the individual income tax. Put differently, if we could get rid of all these tax expenditures, we could cut tax rates roughly in half. Or we could spend a lot more money on other things without increasing the deficit. Uh, secondly, uh, secondly, that Cutting tax expenditures is a way of raising tax re net tax revenues uh, without taking uh, a toll on the economy. If you think about raising tax rates, raising tax rates uh, discourages people from working, discourages people from saving, puts a huge, gives people a huge incentive to engage in tax sheltering. Virtually all economists agree that the cost of raising tax rates is more than just the additional revenue that's collected. There are all these other economic distortions that are, that are created from that. You could raise revenue without cutting rates. And in fact, if you cut tax expenditures enough, you could even cut tax rates and raise revenue in net. There's also the potential for bipartisan support. Uh, on the one hand, I mean, Republicans should favor the idea of cutting tax expenditures because they care about the size of government. They care about, how, I mean, everybody presumably should care about the way government works. And we have a huge part of the government that's kind of under the radar, that's run through the Internal Revenue Service rather than through traditional program agencies. Some of these things probably make sense. But a lot of, they should be subject to scrutiny at the same time that we're applying scrutiny to all of these other spending programs. Democrats ought to care because if we're putting traditional social safety net programs on the chopping block, we should also look at things that benefit middle and upper income people that are run through the, the Internal Revenue Code. So it's kind of a no-brainer that we should just you know, cut $500, $600 billion of tax expenditures and raise enough revenue to uh, get the bud budget under control and cut tax rates too. The only problem is that voters really like these things. When you think about tax expenditures, and when politicians talk about them, they tend to talk about loopholes. And I talked to a reporter the other day, and she said, oh, you know, there are all these stupid things we do through the tax code. And it's true, there are a lot of really stupid things that everybody can agree makes no sense. I mean, the ethanol tax credit is a quintessential example. Uh, there's a tax credit for making energy out of uh, chicken poop. Uh, 
there's actually a chicken poop tax credit. It makes absolutely no sense as policy. We should get rid of it. But if you put all the really, really stupid things that only a few obscure people really care about uh, on the table and you got rid of them, you'd raise a few billion dollars a year. The big money is in things that are enormously popular, like the mortgage interest deduction, the tax exclusion for employer-sponsored health insurance, which almost all economists think is a counterproductive way to encourage people to get health insurance, costs the Treasury something like $300 billion a year in revenues from income taxes and payroll taxes, and it's enormously popular. Uh, so getting rid of tax expenditures is a challenge. There are a number of proposals to, to deal with this. Uh, I've got a note here, SB probably think Simpson Bowles. It's actually, I wrote down slash and burn. The Simpson Bowles proposal, which has gotten an enormous amount of attention, would cut almost all tax expenditures out of, out of the tax code and use part of the money to cut tax rates and some of it to, to raise tax revenues. But politically, it would be extremely difficult. There are other proposals to convert subsidies to credits or uh, uh, to put overall limitations on tax subsidies. My favorite proposal, uh, is actually based on ideas that several people in this room have, have been putting forward for a long time. Zeke Emanuel, who's on the next panel, had proposed a value-added tax to pay for health care. Henry Aaron uh, had made the same proposal maybe 20 years ago. So what's the appeal of having a value-added tax that's dedicated to paying for health care? One is it would allow for income tax cuts, which might make reductions in tax expenditures more feasible. The thing that made the Tax Reform Act of 1986 work was that there was a pot of money that policymakers could draw on to cut individual income tax rates. Uh, there's actually a good example of how it was really an advantage that most people don't think like economists, that <laughs> there was a, a large increase in tax on corporations, and that was used to eliminate some, a lot of tax expenditures and cut individual income tax rates in a revenue-neutral way. Well, we're not going to have corporate tax increases now. There's a good argument for actually cutting corporate taxes uh, that are relatively high in the United States compared with the rest of the world. A value-added tax could be an, a new source of revenue that you could use to pay for individual income tax rate cuts, uh, and it might make it more feasible to cut or at least limit some of the big tax expenditures. Uh, second of all, if the value-added tax was actually earmarked to paying for health care, for the first time there would be a price tag on the health care services the federal government is providing. The federal government is paying for Medicare, <coughs> Medicaid, which is becoming increasingly a program for, 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 for seniors uh, because half of nursing home care is paid for by Medicaid. Uh, and people think that it's free. I think one of the scariest things about the 2010 election was when somebody at a Tea Party rally said, uh, get the government's hands off of my Medicare. Uh, Everybody in this room knows that Medicare is a public program, but a lot of people out in the public think that Medic the government is paying for it so they don't have to. Uh, it's also true that people think that the health insurance they get at work is being paid for by their employers and not by themselves. So the advantage of a value-added tax that was earmarked to paying for health care is that if we couldn't control health care costs, and doing things to control health care will inevitably involve some difficult trade-offs, that the value-added tax rate would go up and up and up, and that would presumably put some pressure on policymakers to make sensible cuts. Another advantage is that <clears throat> if we had a value-added tax that was paying for health care, the big, fastest sort, growing source of spending for the government uh, would, would be paid by everybody. In fact, there would be skin in the game uh, for the whole population and not just for the 55% or so of people who pay in income taxes on net. Uh, it also, if you had a value-added tax paying for a significant portion of the federal government, then you could cut individual income tax rates, which would mean that on net, our tax system would be more conducive to, be more conducive to saving. It wouldn't be double taxing saving like the individual income tax. It doesn't go as far as some people, I, I suspect uh, Professor Hubbard will, 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 will be, be making the argument for consumption tax as a replacement for the income tax, but it's a reasonable compromise. And if you look at the rest of the world, uh, Countries that actually have r larger government sectors have value-added tax, and they have relatively less reliance on income taxes and, a, and, and often a lower burden on capital uh, uh, than, than, than we do. Uh, and, of course, people dislike earmarked taxes less than other taxes. The Social Security tax is actually the 
least despised tax in the federal arsenal because people uh, favor what it pays for. The second thing that I would do is try to move towards a return-free system for most Americans. Uh, it sounds like it might be kind of a gimmick. I mean, certainly it would be simpler, but an advantage of moving towards a return-free system is that you'd have to radically simplify it. And once you had a return-free system, introducing complicated new tax expenditures would be more difficult because uh, more people would have to file income tax returns. And if people got, in the idea, got the idea that uh, they basically would just pay their, 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 they, they, they would pay their, withhold, their withholding tax and at the end of the year they'd be done, which could be done in a simple system for 50 or 60 percent of Americans, uh, that that would put something of a break on further complications. Uh, the aversion of this proposal, the VAT is not earmarked to pay for health care because I wasn't able to convince my colleagues of that. But a version of this was put together by the Bipartisan Policy Center. It had two tax rates. The top rate was 27%. It eliminated many tax expenditures, and it converted others to credits so that, in fact, the, the subsidies could be provided directly to mortgage companies or to, uh, uh, to charities, for example, which maybe sounds like a radical idea, but actually that's the way it's done in the UK. If you make a contribution to charity, your tax break goes directly to them. You don't have to file a return to, to get it. Uh, another, another option, a carbon tax question mark on my notes. Virtually all economists would agree that a carbon tax is kind of a no-brainer. That it's a one example of a tax that actually makes the economy work better. In, in the sense that uh, if you believe that uh, man-made uh, global warming is a real phenomenon, you're putting a price on the cost of carbon emissions. Uh, people, Politicians like to think, they look at the carbon tax and say, well, economists like a carbon tax. It's a way we could raise a lot of revenue. The best thing to do with the carbon tax would be to recycle the revenue and provide subsidies to lower, particularly uh, broad-based subsidies to offset the revenue that's raised. And again, that might make it more feasible to eliminate tax expenditures. I don't underestimate the difficulty of enact enacting a carbon tax, certainly in the case when we have a Senate where West Virginia gets two votes and Oklahoma gets two votes and so on. But conceivably, a carbon tax could be a way of both making the economy work better and bringing in some revenue that could, uh, kind of like the, the corporate tax increase in 1986, would soften the blow of eliminating some tax expenditures for lower income people. So uh, my last, last set of notes says, can tax reform happen? And the answer, of course, is no. But the Tax Reform Act of 1986 was impossible, too. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Well, I'm going to be slightly more optimistic than that. Um, I may not look like a radical, but I'm going to give you some radical optimism for tax reform. But it's fair, I think, to begin with some pessimism, too. But first, a, a couple of voices of gratitude. First, to John Chauvin and the Sieper team. I have been a producer, a consumer, and an observer of this organization for uh, many years, and it has really helped this debate enormously. And second is gratitude for all of you. We are a t had a tough act to follow in Mohammed, who told you either you will be wealthy or wiped out with roughly equal probability, <laughs> and yet you are still here. Um, so we're, we're grateful on the panel for that. Lynn's remarks and a bit of what I wanted to say to you is a reminder, and actually part of my radical optimism, that we cannot consider tax reform as a separate discussion from fiscal policy generally. The big question, economists will all tell you when you think about public finances, fiscal policy, is how big should government be and what do you want government to do? The first question is the size and the scope of government. Then the second question is what kind of financing mechanism do you want? Taxes today versus taxes tomorrow, borrowing. And then what kind of tax system do you want? I think both of those questions are important. I'm going to talk about tax reform, but wrap it also in the budget uh, as I go. Much of my own work over uh, more time than I care to remember has been focused on tax reform, on saving, on investment, and entrepreneurship. I believe there are ample reasons to think tax reform is one of the biggest tonics we could do for our economy. 
But I would note that this is a discussion that's been happening a long time. I see Dave Wessel here. I did an interview with Dave Wessel in 1992 when I was at the Treasury Department. And he asked me, when did I think that the ideas would come to fruition? I opined that it would be when my son graduated from college. The Wall Street Journal noted he wasn't even two years old at the time of the interview. And I will come back to that interview uh, in a moment. So first of all, what is tax reform? You know, it may sound like an elementary question, but many politicians talk about this in very different ways. To my mind, what tax reform means is low marginal rates, a broad tax base, an easing or elimination of double or triple or multiple layers of taxation of the same activity, and the removing or at least extreme mitigation of tax biases against saving, against investment, and against organizational forms. I got in trouble many years ago when I shellacked onto a blackboard at the Treasury Department as I was leaving, broaden the base and lower the rates. I had to pay to have that uh, cleaned up, yet I still think it is the right answer. A second issue in tax reform that economists often fight about, probably a little too much, is whether it should be about income tax reform or consumption tax reform. I have a philosophical bias in favor of consumption tax reform. If I take two individuals, each of whom earns $100, one spends his in champagne, the other saves uh, for the future, it strikes me as an odd tax system uh, that would punish uh, the saver. But I think if you look at economic differences, they're actually sometimes overstated. Let me give you an example. The Treasury and the American Law Institute a couple of decades ago put out tax variants uh, of the income tax that were comprehensive and centered on business tax reform. And their income tax reform was, let's tax all businesses at the same rate, corporate or non-corporate, no double level corporate tax. Let's disallow interest deductions, but let's not tax dividends, capital gains, uh, or business paid interest.